This is Thursday, September 6, 2012. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Jeff Valetti of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Erwin Thompson. Welcome, Erwin. Thank you. Nice to be here. Mm. Glad you could be with us. May I ask when you were born? I was born on the 14th of January, 1937. And where were you born? I was born in Glasgow, Scotland. And what town do you currently live in? I live in Needham, Mass. Marital status? Married. Do you have children? I have two children. And tell us a bit about what it was like growing up in Glasgow. Well, I actually grew up during the time of the Second World War. So that was pretty traumatic because mm -hmm. Glasgow was one of the areas that the Germans were bombing. Mm -hmm. The Clyde side uh, where Glasgow is was the major shipbuilding area, in one of the major ones during the Second World War. So we were subjected to pretty heavy German bombing. Mm -hmm. So we had the thing of having the bomb shelters and the sirens going off at night, the searchlights flashing across the sky, having to get up mm -hmm. as a family and run to the bomb shelters. All that was pretty traumatic. And uh, unless you've gone through it, you can't begin to understand what it's like. Mm -hmm. And you had a family member who served during the war and tragically didn't make it. Yes. And you, uh, back in 2007, you published this collection of your paintings and poems yes. called Milestones and Memories. We'll just show that for you for a moment. And you wrote a poem based, I believe, on your uncle. Yes. If you'd be so kind as to um, read the poem and show the painting. Uh, I would be happy to do that. This was a very emotional thing in our family, this young man was my mother's favorite brother. And what was his name? His name was Sam, Sam Haddo. And uh, he was sent off in the Merchant Marine when he was only 18 at the beginning of the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And he was in the first large convoy to go from Britain to America. And that was when the Germans made they brought out their, the first time they brought out the U-boats. Mm -hmm. So this convoy had about a hundred boats and 80 of them were sank on the European side of the Atlantic. They actually never got out of the Bay of Biscayne. So of course he went down with his ship and was lost. So I had his photograph on my desk all of my life actually. He's very like me, and my mother always used to say that to me, so it was kind of an emotional attachment. So when I was doing my book of poems and paintings, I was looking at his photograph one day, and I said, okay, I gotta do a poem about this mm -hmm. and do a painting. So I would like to read the poem, if that would appeal. And it's called Study in Blue. In full dress uniform, he stares seriously out from his Navy photo. I see myself in the deep waves of his hair. In another life, my lost uncle stays forever vital, confident in unknowing. In the periscope of time, he is leaving the teenage of his life to sail into ice. And this is the painting that I did of him and my concept of the sinking of his ship and the loss of his life when he went to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Very haunting, incredible. So actually, it's very emotional for me. Mm -hmm. Just to look at this. Yeah. So 
Oh, you went through this pretty much through most of your childhood. VE Day must have been yes. a great... There, there were great celebrations, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> bonfires in the streets, mm -hmm. all kinds of things. Uh, I can say, actually, uh, in contrast to a lot of these celebrations, there was absolutely no vandalism or anything of that nature. It was just mm -hmm. a tremendous, such a tremendous sense of relief. And uh, don't forget, we during the war, we were all on strict food rationing, so... Mm -hmm. There wasn't a lot of food and goodies to play around with. <laughs> but we did bring out a few things to celebrate, but mm -hmm. there wasn't a lot of food or, you know, mm -hmm. candies or what, just enough to go around. Do you remember living during the wartime? Uh, did you encounter British American sailors? Uh, we No, we didn't see any American sailors. We, I did know a lot of, or bumped into a mm -hmm. lot of British sailors because Glasgow was a huge port. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and I, so I happened to live near the river mm -hmm. where, the, where the port was, so I would always be bumping into these guys. Back in those days, um, just to say, uh, if you lived, that would be sort of like living in, not quite, but similar to living in a Navy town. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody really believed in the righteousness of the cause, shall we say. Mm -hmm. So they were a very determined and cheery bunch, uh, no feeling that they were absolutely doing the right thing. Of course, the difference there was that Britain was fighting for its life mm -hmm. in so many different kinds of ways. So Glasgow was a very big part of that effort, building the ships, being bombed, and so on and so forth. Tell us what life was like after the war. Well, after the war, believe it or not, and most Americans don't understand this, we were still in food rationing. So things were pretty grim. and. Uh, the vets were all returning from the war, a lot of them with post-traumatic stress disorder, which wasn't recognized as mm -hmm. an illness at that time. And so I was very familiar with that because we had a lot of vets in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a strange thing because although nobody understood that syndrome, Everybody knew that if somebody had been in the war and they were war damaged, mm -hmm. first of all, they had this just saying among the people that he was war damaged. That was what the phrase that they used. And, and it had a specific connotation, meaning that they knew that the person wasn't quite all there, that mm -hmm. they were not capable of holding down a responsible job. And the, the civilian population were very actually kind to these people helped them along, gave them food, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. It was like an unconscious reaction mm -hmm. or subconscious reaction to trying to help them out. Okay. How about you growing up? You go to high school or? Yeah, well, uh, you know, <laughs> all of these things I think helped motivate me to think about the fact that yes, I wanted to create some sort of meaningful existence for myself. And uh, I had a family doctor who identified to my mother, A, that I was a boyhood genius, which I think is highly unlikely. But B, she said I, was def I had definitely the right makeup to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. So from nine years of age, <laughs> there was this total conviction in the family that I was going to be a doctor, although there were no college graduates in the family. Mm -hmm. So if I was going to do that, I was going to be the first college graduate and I would certainly be the first physician. I was indoctrinated. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you went with it. <laughs> I went with it, yeah. Well, actually, that becomes even more amazing in relation to my army story, as I'll make clear to you later, but mm -hmm. to say 
that I did advance rapidly through high school. I was advanced a year, so I started medical school. In Scotland, the system is that they have a combined, is, it's actually very advanced, they have a combined pre-med and med, mm -hmm. so that they have a much shorter program of either five or six years. Back then, it was six years. Mm -hmm. So I actually started medical school when I was 17 years of age. And where did you study? University of Glasgow Medical School. And how was that? Fabulous, because University of Glasgow is, uh, was founded in 1451. So they have a long string of illustrious uh, physicians, surgeons, mm -hmm. internists, uh, and I just felt that I was part of that stream. Mm -hmm going back hundreds of years. So you, uh, when did you decide to specialize in OBGYN? Well, that wasn't until after graduation. And um, I, what I did was, after I finished medical school, I did one year, uh, one year of internship in Glasgow, mm -hmm. in the university hospital there, I did six, the system was I did six months of medicine and six months of surgery. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I met up with some uh, attending physicians who were doing OBGYN. And I got, and they were involved in some big scientific project that I got very interested in. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, was what started my whole career Although I had to do an OBGYN residency first, I was actually interested in the basic science of reproductive endocrinology aspects of that. So that's what kept driving me into, after the residency program, I did two fellowships and I started a PhD mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. You not only studied in Scotland, but you told me before the interview you also studied in the United States. I studied here in the United States, yeah. I did, uh, I did, a, I had to do, because of the way the uh, academic requirements were set up, I had to do another internship in the United States. And then I did a four year residency program at the University of Washington in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And then I did. Uh, fellowship. I did the fellowship prior to the residency and mm -hmm. th then I was studying my interest in reproductive endocrinology. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me into my specialty later on mm -hmm. after my army service. Uh, why the University of Washington? Well, I was this particular project that I was interested in. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get too technical about this. That's okay, go ahead. I, just to say that I was interested in steroid protein relationships and mm -hmm. how steroid hormones are carried through the bloodstream, particularly in pregnancy. So that was the reason that I went to University of Washington. Mm -hmm. There was a guy, a professor there who was very interested in the topic and he had a research lab and uh, I applied for a job in his lab mm -hmm. and he accepted me so that's how I ended up there. University of Washington and then PhD in Stockholm? Yes. Well, I started a PhD in Stockholm. Uh, and what year was that? That would be in um, 1966. And then who came a knocking on your door? Knocking on my door came uh, some brigadier general from the U.S. Army, <laughs> who, this is a, the, a very unusual part of the story, and it gets very complex. I had been a resident alien when I was studying at the University of Washington, and I was granted an NIH fellowship to continue my studies at the University of Stockholm in Sweden. So I went there and started a PhD there. Then at this time the army was desperately short of physicians and so they were scouring through everywhere all their databases to find who were likely, I don't know what the word is, victims maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Um, anyway, I qualified because I had done all this incredible intensive training and they needed OBGYN people in mm -hmm. Europe. 
So they located me through my NIH fellowship, which is the irony of ironies because I'm this academic doc in Stockholm and suddenly via the mail, I'm a captain in the US Army. Even though you're a Scot. <laughs> Even though I was a Scot. So I was a Scotsman living in Stockholm and I was drafted by mail. <laughs> and uh, at the same time, I was given the option either to al allow myself to be drafted or if not, then I would be declared an undesirable alien and could not be readmitted to the United States. Mm -hmm. So I had a clear option, which was either to accept the commission and come back to the States on their orders or to go to Scotland or Canada or stay in Sweden, all of which were options that were open to me. And you chose to be drafted. I chose to be drafted because I did want to come back to the United States. Um, I was young and foolhardy, no doubt, and I was driven by, at that point, I was driven by my intense interest in the science of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so the best opportunity to continue that would be either in Sweden or USA. Mm -hmm. I very much enjoyed living in Sweden, but it's pretty cold and isolated. In the winter time where I was in Stockholm, it was only daylight between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. The rest of the time is dark, and that's not that far north. Mm -hmm. So I got tired of that. And the first, uh, after you got drafted, you got sent to a place that was not cold or dark. Right. Well, after I got drafted, um, I asked to be allowed to go directly to Europe, but they wouldn't permit that because mm -hmm. I had to come to Fort Sam Houston, where there's the huge hospital there mm -hmm. uh, at Fort Sam Houston Army Hospital. So I had to come back to the base there for basic officer training. And tell us what that was like. Well, I would say it was, for me, it was traumatic because, think of it this way, for all these years of my life, I was involved and engaged in academic medicine and studying academic medicine, and that's where my head was at. And suddenly, I'm part of the U.S. Army machine. Mm -hmm. Now, I wasn't totally nouveau because during my medical school training to make some money and help pay my way through medical school, I had been in the officer training corps of the British Army. Oh, wow. But I chose not to get into that mm -hmm. with the U.S. Army in case they said, okay, this guy knows how to fire a howitzer, we better send him to Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> so instead I focused more on the fact that you know, this was the science and medicine of what I did. So, but nonetheless, it was a very um, traumatic experience for me to find myself like that, number one. Number two, I had a sheaf of papers that thick that said I was destined for two years service in the U.S. Army Medical Corps as what they call an obligated volunteer. I loved that term. What in the world is an obligated volunteer? That's what they call <laughs> you. you. But of course, you're basically a draftee. It doesn't matter what it would be in, the medical corps, the Marines, whatever, you're a draftee. But they had this wonderful term for the officers that they were off obligated <laughs> volunteers. Anyway, so I get to Fort Sam Houston, and I'm there exactly five days, and I get a request to be interviewed by the commanding general you got to understand, that's extremely rare. Mm -hmm. Commanding General never wants to see some novice coming into the <laughs> Fort Sam Houston. Anyway, I go there, and he went through the story and said, wow, he said, this is a very unusual story, and I know we can use you in Germany instead of serving you, sending you to Vietnam. So, you know, I never really had thought that it would serve me to Vietnam with all my training. And they said I would go to Germany, where I knew they needed me and they could really capitalize on my knowledge. I said, well, yeah, that makes sense to me. He said, there's one little catch here. He said, 
For you to be assigned to Germany, you have to sign up for an additional year. So that would go from mm -hmm. two years to three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that created some difficulty for me because I actually, not understanding the system, I refused. I thought they would value my services enough <laughs> that Germany would be automatic, but it wasn't. So it became a source of dissatisfaction between myself and the commanding general. But they have ways. In the end, I signed up for another year. Mm -hmm. Off you go to Germany. <laughs> yeah, or I was going to go to Vietnam. <laughs> that oh, was the way. <laughs> I mean, it was inconceivable to me that they would do that, but they did it. Mm -hmm. I actually knew people that that happened to. Now, I don't want to come across too critical. It's a huge organization. They're trying to do their job mm -hmm. in time of warfare. And that's how they're able to do that. They can, uh, I won't say violate, they can change all their own rules in time of warfare. And that was time of warfare. Mm -hmm. So from Fort Sam Houston, I was sent directly to Germany. And there mm -hmm. I was at uh, an institution that's called the Landstuhl Regional Medical Center. Now exactly where in Germany is that located? So the title is Landstuhl, so that is exactly where it's located, which is a small town, mm -hmm. like Natick actually, close to a larger sized town called Kaiserslautern, so it's in the southwestern part of Germany mm -hmm. near Heidelberg. Okay. This is a huge facility. It's the biggest army hospital in Europe. And that was, was that the case when you were there in the 60s? Yes. And how uh, big when was I first went there, it was called the Second General Hospital. But they were expanding it all the time due to pressures of, mm -hmm. of uh, wounded soldiers being brought back from Vietnam. So somewhere in that time frame, I was there from 19... 68 to 1971. Somewhere in that time frame, it became officially the, the Landstuhl Regional Medical Center mm -hmm. and was expanded enormously, and then they kept expanding it. Mm -hmm. And you told me before the interview, you are one of 100 doctors. At least 100. There were and more than 100, yeah. You were next to an Air Force base. Yes which would make you, yeah, a rather big medical center. It was a huge complex because Ramstein was the Air Force Base, mm -hmm. was and is the biggest U.S. base outside of the United States. I think it's bigger than any other facility, even in the Middle East. But it certainly was the biggest one in Europe at that time. Mm -hmm. And you were, uh, had a captain's rank? I had a captain's yeah. rank at that time, mm -hmm. and that's where it starts to get really crazy. First of all, I was working very hard. There were eight doctors there, we took care. Our base was like 50,000 families with, I mean, our base, of, our patient base, but mm -hmm. then around that there were other families that we took care of, so we were very busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was drafted as a captain. Back then, in the Medical Corps, I don't know how it is now, but back then the system was that you were promoted from when you first started medical school, the years of mm -hmm. service, which were counted as years of service in the Army. So to my shock and amazement, in three months, I was promoted to major because some computer was whirring in the Pentagon and picked out the fact that I had now I, I, 14 years of service. Mm -hmm. I was 14 years into service, so suddenly I'm a major. That helps, let me tell you, but also it also engendered some uh, resentment among the regular Army guys because they needed so many doctors there that there were three other draftees like myself, but mm -hmm. there were five regular Army guys who had done their stint in the Army. So suddenly this young punk is a major. That didn't go down well. Um, but I was doing my job, and actually I brought a lot of fresh ideas because I was just straight out of academic medicine. I had mm -hmm. 
in some ways more advanced training than they had. And I had a lot of ideas and I worked very hard. I didn't treat it lightly and I didn't try to goof off. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just my nature. Mm -hmm. Well, three months later, to my total amazement, I get another letter saying, congratulations, you're now a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. What? So now, <laughs> I'm a big wheel. <laughs> I've got, I can move off base if I want, I've got my own staff car, blah, 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 stuff like that. So in the first six months, I mean, you got two promotions? Yeah, but to, to go to light colonel in six months, that's unheard of. I think oh. I was probably one of the youngest, they call them light colonels, lieutenant colonels uh -huh. ever. And if I'd kept on that track, no doubt I would have been the Surgeon General. <laughs> oh, undoubtedly. So you were uh, still specializing in OBGYN. Yeah, so my work there was I was a regular, as it were, attending physician. Mm -hmm. I took regular night call every third or fourth night, regular weekend call every third or fourth night. I did a lot of surgery, obstetric and gynecologic surgery. Mm -hmm. I was available for consultation. And amazingly enough, I had specialized as part of my academic interest in infertility. And nobody had paid any attention to infertility. So I actually started, this is not in any records anywhere, and I didn't get any purple hearts for mm -hmm. it, but I actually started an infertility clinic in this hospital, which was pretty amazing. And mm -hmm. so I got just tons of patients because it, as a specialty, back in those days, it was completely ignored by the Army. You can't ignore them for that. They were, were providing basic OBGYN services mm -hmm. to dependents. And so I, I want to emphasize, I, I'm not being critical when I say oh, that. It's just mm -hmm. that I was interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. So it turned out there were huge numbers of patients. And you were serving just military families, not the families? Just military around. families. They didn't treat civilians at all, mm -hmm. uh, and well, there were some exceptions for that, like for some reasons, nuns. <laughs> so I had a little complement of nuns that I took care of. <laughs> nuns. So that, yeah, the local nuns. <laughs> oh, okay. Can't explain any of that to you. I mean, <laughs> well, I, there is a sub-level of that, mm -hmm. but I think I'm not going to that. <laughs> All right, tell us about uh, some of the patients that you were treating. This is caused the late 1960s. Yeah, so yeah. I was there 68 to 71. Right. Right. Uh, tell us uh, what that whole atmosphere must have been like. Um, well, it was part of it. There was underlying stress because First of all, there were and are a huge number of military personnel in Europe mm -hmm. that the American public doesn't know anything about or ever thinks about. But they were there then, remember, as part of the Cold War effort. Mm -hmm. So the Berlin Wall was still in existence. And of course, there was the issue of Russia and mm -hmm. communist aggression, and that was one issue. And then secondly, there was the impact of the Vietnam War. Even although we were there in Europe, it impacted us because a lot of the soldiers were brought back to Ramstein for either advanced surgery mm -hmm. or uh, there were a lot of psychiatric patients were brought back to the hospital as part of a deliberate, you'd have to say, public health policy mm -hmm. that um, the soldiers were pretty severely damaged, and I guess they didn't want to release a flood of them back into the United States, mm -hmm. back into the homeland. So the corollary of that was that we were in Germany, where life was fairly normal. I mean, considering it was a huge hospital, it would be like working in an academic center here in Boston, sort of a thing on the one hand. And so on the other hand, we weren't aware of how unpopular the Vietnam War was in the United States. Mm -hmm. We just weren't aware of it because it wasn't reported in the military. The military newspapers that we read and all that stuff didn't um, go into that very much. Mm -hmm. So 
while we had this linkage to Vietnam, we weren't aware of how unpopular the war in Vietnam was back in America. That's very interesting because uh, as a lieutenant colonel, did you live off base? I did, yeah. And you could read other than military newspapers? Well, I lived in a little German village. Uh -huh. So, in fact, I, my German became fairly fluent, which I've lost now, but I didn't have any access to English newspapers or mm -hmm. anything. There weren't any. Right. Because I lived in a sort of remote little village. What about radio or TV? Uh, didn't see much reporting going on in mm -hmm. any of that. But, in fact, I'll say, for economic reasons, the Germans, so I was living among Germans, I was part of the German village life, I played mm -hmm. soccer from my days in Scotland, I was in the German soccer team. They were all in favor of all this because there was great economic mm -hmm. uh, returns to them. Mm -hmm. Like for example, I lived in a three-story house and two of the stories were rented by American service personnel. I, there was a U.S. Air Force captain at the top, me in the middle, and the landlord was on the lower flat. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the houses in the village were built like that deliberately by the Germans, and they reaped great economic benefit mm -hmm. from us being there, so we were welcome. Okay. Without going too much into doctor-patient confidentiality, right. Could you give us a general idea of what some of your patients uh, were like? Uh, I would say there was always, there was the general stuff of OBGYN that, you mm -hmm. know, when people get pregnant and they need a lot of care, then they're happy about that and they have a happy delivery. There was always some underlying problem that if they, despite the fact that they might be pregnant, their husbands might be sent to Vietnam, mm -hmm. something like that. So there were a lot of domestic issues like that where um, families, family life might be interrupted just simply by the mm -hmm. fact that the personnel were sent to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So that kind of complicated everything we did. Right. After three years, what happened? Uh, 1971, were you finally released? Or? Uh, yeah, so after I did my three years, um, I came back to, I, well, I came, shouldn't say came back, I came to Boston. Mm -hmm. During my time in the Army, I'd been contacted by a professor of gynecologic surgery at Harvard and mm -hmm. the Peter Brink, as it was in those days, Peter Brink, Ben Brigham Hospital, mm -hmm. who was aware of my work and had in fact visited my laboratory in Sweden. And he kept in touch with me by annual notes asking me how I was doing and saying that he wanted me to come to Boston to work with him. I guess I made an impression on him in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. So I always kind of blew that off and didn't think that that would go anywhere. But lo and behold, he did keep track of me. So about three or four months ahead of time, I was thinking of going to the West Coast, back to Seattle. Mm -hmm. And he sent me a letter saying that he would like me to come to Boston. So then I started to think about that seriously and uh, I ended up in Boston. Um, so when I came here with my family, he was the only person that I knew in this area. It wasn't an issue of me returning to my home where mm -hmm. I'd been before. It was an issue of me just following my in a sense, academic career and come into an, e an area where I had never been before. After spending three years in the Army as an Army doctor, uh, did you feel um, like out of sync when you, hit, when you hit the Boston, aside from the not knowing only one person? Well, yes, because um, for various reasons. I didn't feel out of sync in terms of my work mm -hmm. because what I was doing was so obtuse that I was basically the only person doing it. <laughs> and I was able to work in his laboratory to develop my own uh, interests. So he was very gracious that way. Uh, I was out of sync because I'd just been in the military and now mm -hmm. I'm suddenly in Boston and I'm at Harvard Medical School and Peter Brigham Hospital, which are among the two 
toughest place, places to be mm -hmm. if you don't have either contacts or people who are going to be pushing you or whatever. He was the only person who knew me. Mm -hmm. That was one aspect. The other aspect was I was shocked at the, I mean, I was really shocked at the amount of uh, anti-Vietnam War feeling there mm. was, particularly here in Massachusetts and Boston. And I suppose being in that environment, i.e. Harvard Medical School, Peter Van Brinkman Hospital, which was full of these strongly, uh, what should we say, uh, people opposed to war, but not knowing anything about the actual effort. But the, the anti-war feeling was very strong. So mm -hmm. I was shocked when I'd just be engaged in conversation. People would ask me what I'd been doing, you know, assuming that I'd been working in some academic whatever and mm -hmm. say, well, I just got back from Germany. I was in the army, blah, blah, blah. The, it was a definite change in atmosphere. Oh, and it took me a while to get used to that mm -hmm. because also my boss and his wife were very active in the Democratic Party here with Howard Zinn. I don't know, does that name ring any oh, bells Oh, it does, does it ever. All right, so they were great friends with Howard Zinn. Mm -hmm. And they would have these dinner parties where we'd mm -hmm. have a big party and then there'd be, there'd be some drinks and then people would sit down in this huge sitting room. They had a beautiful home, huge sitting room. And uh, then Howard would stand up and give one of his standard anti-war speeches. So here am I, just back, mm -hmm. <laughs> a decorated veteran from <laughs> Europe, <laughs> and this old guy <laughs> is talking about how the United States is blah, 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 like that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't take kindly to that for the reason that I, my whole life had been changed dramatically, not by my own volition, but by U.S. government policy, and I was some little sucker, mm -hmm. Scottish sucker who'd been sucked up <laughs> and sent to Europe, and Howard Zinn spent all of his life here in Boston yak, yak, yakking about anti-war. So I was in that environment, and it was kind of hard for me to deal with in the beginning. I am very adaptable, after all. I mean, I've lived in five or six different countries. I've worked in five or six different mm -hmm. countries. I've known thousands of people all over the Western world, so I adapted. But that was a little, just to answer specifically your question, that was right. a little tricky for me. Has your feelings changed over the years? About what? Well, uh, let's see, about the anti-war movement in Vietnam, have you got another perspective on that? or? Uh, do you still feel the same way? I would say I've since that it, since this is how I look at it. Mm -hmm. First of all, it totally and utterly changed my life. Mm -hmm. Like I say, I was at some academic wog, <laughs> just involved <laughs> only in a pursuit of some fantastic thing in academic medicine. Suddenly, I'm in the U.S. Army. I come back from that to the United States to find I'm one of the most unpopular guys on the planet. Not me personally, and right. I didn't take it personally. I'm being a little humorous that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, that was the experience that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of young Americans had. That they were drafted, they were sent to Vietnam, and when they came back here, they were universally unpopular. Mm -hmm. I've talked to dozens of them, mm -hmm. that that was a total shock to them, that they as American citizens, and by the way, I still wasn't an American citizen, <laughs> I was still a Scottish citizen. Uh -huh. So um, there are several things that I would just like the opportunity to emphasize about that. First of all, that I'm not anti-army in any way whatsoever. They did what they had to do and I did what I had to do to accommodate to their system. The, the fact that they promoted me to Lieutenant Colonel 61 shows that they didn't have any <laughs> personal animosity to me. I mean, that's like an amazing thing. When I tell people that who've been in the services, they absolutely cannot believe it. Mm. It's unheard of. 
Normally, you got to be in the military 14, 15 years before you become a light colonel. Right. So here am I cruising around, you know, in my staff car and whatever, people saluting me, and blah, blah, blah. But anyway, the, uh, the thing about it is that I, I feel, obviously I've thought a lot about it. Two major things I feel about it is U.S. foreign policy has been totally wrong completely wrong from probably after the Korean War, maybe the Korean War, but after the Korean War, up until this minute as we talk. Mm -hmm. Part of it is that coming from Europe, I've always been interested in foreign policy. I, I had a background where I studied European history for three or 400 years, which was constantly war. Mm -hmm. And America is simply repeating that process. We, it's like we are reinventing the wheel. We have learned nothing about looking at European history to see all the mistakes they made. So, I don't personally feel that that's anti-war in a way, but it's an intellectual thing, abhorrence of the fact mm -hmm. that war is an absolute waste of American resources. So, since I was personally involved, and my life totally changed by the Vietnam War, and you can look at that, the Vietnam War, the Iraqi War was obviously a terrible mistake, Afghanistan war the same, so that's all U.S. foreign policy. Afghanistan, Russia was whipped in Afghanistan by, mm -hmm. and after 10 years, they withdrew from Afghanistan. And don't forget they have this enormous contiguous border with Afghanistan, right. which they couldn't conquer. Mm -hmm. So why in the world we would go in there, it sure beats me. Mm -hmm. So from that sense, I'm very much anti-war, but it's not based on my personal experience except all the wasted lives that mm -hmm. I've seen. I feel that very strongly. It's also an anal a, a historical an analysis of war, when you look, go back 500 years, whatever, is an incredible waste of time, resources, money, mm -hmm. human life. The other thing I would say on a personal basis is um, I've been to the Vietnam War Memorial four or five times now. Mm -hmm. You get out of there. There are people weeping. It's amazing. It is. So, the Vietnam War is still a huge wound in the soul of America that mm -hmm. has not been resolved. I can say that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And I get all these pleas from Vietnam War organizations for donations and whatever, and mm -hmm. they send me all these sob stories, which I know to be true, because mm -hmm. I know personally, me, people who were young men, and in 50 years, or all the years subsequent to that, the war was over in 1975, so 30 years subsequent to that, their lives have only gone down the tubes. Right. And on the other hand, the Vietnam War Memorial, was completed, uh, I think, in 1982. Yeah, it was 1982 when the wall was built. That was Maya Lin. And that is just the most moving thing. Mm. We had the uh, moving wall up here in right. June 2011. Right. A, and we had like 10,000 visitors that yep. weekend. It's just an incredible experience. It's incredible when you go there because there are just people weeping everywhere. Mm. Now, after uh, you left the military, did you join any veterans organizations? No, I did not. Um, under the conditions of the service at that time, uh, if you were an obligated volunteer, to use that wonderful <laughs> term, uh, once you were discharged, you were obliged to be a member of the National Guard for three additional years. Uh huh. Now. I had a unit, but I didn't have to report to the unit. Basically, I just had to confirm to them twice a year who, where, who I was, where my location was, and that I was ready for active duty mm -hmm. if that required my return to service. So there weren't any requirements for it beyond that. Uh, there was no, nowhere that I had to report. There was no, there were no reimbursements. It was mm -hmm. like a statutory thing. That, so I followed that for an additional three years, and then I was officially discharged. And what rank? 
Uh, same rank. Like Lieutenant, Colonel. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what did you do after your military service? You're in Boston. Right. Well, I reverted to farm. I was an academic physician teaching at Harvard and the Peter Brigham, as it was in those days, mm -hmm. the Peter Brigham, Brigham Hospital. And uh, following my specialty, which was reproductive endocrinology. So I bounced between the Harvard Hospitals, Peter Brigham, Brigham Hospital, which later became the Brigham and Women's Hospital, mm -hmm. and the Beth Israel Hospital. So I was very involved in both of these hospitals in that specialty, which later became officially recognized as the specialty of reproductive endocrinology. Mm -hmm. So for that, um, I already had done all the training without it being acknowledged as a separate specialty. So I just fell into that because I'd already done all that. I'd done two fellowships, four-year mm -hmm. residency, blah, blah, blah. Right. And how long were you an academic physician, or a physician academic? Well, um, I was a full-time academic for five years after I came back here, and then I moved more into practice where I was practicing reproductive endocrinology. Mm -hmm. And that became an official, actually became an official branch of medicine. And so the, the usual way they do that is, first of all, they have three-year fellowships now, and I had completed all of that yeah. part by chance. And then they, they always do lay on an additional exam, testing. So I was the first person to become um, licensed as a reproductive endocrinologist by examination here in New England. I took the exam as among the first people to take it. I passed it, so I became an official reproductive endocrinologist of Harvard Medical School and at that point, the Beth Israel Hospital. Mm -hmm. And by all of these trainings that I had been doing, because I worked with issues involving egg and sperm interaction, embryo growth, hormone effect on egg production, it was the perfect setup for in vitro fertilization without that term ever having been invented. So I actually went on to become the senior founder of Boston IVF, uh -huh. which was and is the biggest IVF center in the world. Wow. Now, I don't have anything to do with them now. I retired in mm -hmm. 2000. But, I mean, that was a pretty singular achievement Definitely. for how my life went. Uh -huh. So what are you doing these days? Well, now I am and have been for 20 odd years because I was doing it before I retired, an artist and a painter mm -hmm. and a poet. I've written a book of my own poems and paintings. I have numerous shows. I'm actually a very serious artist. And mm -hmm. uh, this year, this being September 2012, I've already had five shows of my work. Mm -hmm. Last year I had a show at the Natick Library <laughs> in your big downstairs room there. I think okay. I have like 18 paintings on display. Uh -huh. You seem to prefer abstract. Yes, very much so. <clears throat> I am an abstract painter. Uh, I, I think a lot. I guess it's a bad habit that I have, which I've done all my life and I can't get out of it. So I'm always thinking about concepts and ideas, and what happens with me is that I want to capture some of that mm -hmm. in a visual form. And that's how come, I, when you have that as your motivation, you almost mm -hmm. always end up painting abstract things mm -hmm. because it's just abstract mm -hmm. ideas that are in your head and you want to find a way to express that visually. Mm -hmm. And your wife, Rusty, tell us a little bit about her. Well, Rusty <laughs> is a film producer and um, she came to that late in life. Before that, she was an interior decorator and is very good at that. She's a very, very creative person, wonderful uh, sense of creativity, wonderful sense of color. She's mm -hmm. one of the best colorists I know. But she got interested in film about five years ago, and she's, she made some very original small films 
10 minutes uh, where she was involved with nature mm -hmm. and color and music, uh, combining these all into some forms, which she's shown that locally in the area, and she got a lot of acclaim for that. I miss out the fact that some of her interest in music stems from the fact that at some point in her life she was a professional singer. <laughs> so mm -hmm. she's got a great voice. Now she's moved into making a serious documentary about female role in the military, an absolutely fascinating subject mm -hmm. about the difficulties of being a female in the U.S. military. You just hear most commonly, as you know, about the subject of rape and mm -hmm. sexual, what, this and that, but there's so much more to these. I've been involved in her interviewing 50, 60, 70 of these people, and they're so young women, they're so intensely patriotic. It's mm -hmm. like unbelievable. Like, it's hard to imagine where it comes from, mm -hmm. but it's there. So that's what she's focusing on, focusing on in a very positive way. And she's already completed a trailer about that, which has been very successful, and she's hoping to move on to full-scale production. And I understand there is a website where folks could see the trailer? Yep. It is that particular uh, trailer is called noequalmovie.com. So noequalmovie, all one word, dot com. That takes you directly to the trailer. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's had very positive feedback from thousands of viewers. Oh, can I tell you about my website? Go right <laughs> ahead. <laughs> that gave me the idea. Fantastic website with videos of myself yakking about art and all kinds of mm -hmm. things like that. It's Erwin Thompson Art, all one word, dot com. Erwin Thompson Art, dot com. Splendid. Now, you mentioned earlier that your two children, did either one of them serve in the military? No. Uh, very simply, well, they just went on to other things. My right. daughter was always interested in commerce and so she went into financial mm -hmm. things and she wanted to move away from New England so she's in Chicago now. And my son is, uh, he's very interested in, uh, th he's got a very therapeutic personality. So he's a physiotherapist slash academic guy doing his PhD and he's in, the, in California. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Thompson, is there anything you'd like to add to this before we wrap up this interview? Only to say that uh, while the Vietnam War totally and completely interrupted what I was doing in my life, I still can't figure out in the last analysis if uh, I would have done anything different Mm -hmm. I, I suppose one, once I chose to accept uh, being drafted into the military, that was like a dramatic interruption in my whole life, which has been basically academic medicine and very intellectually difficult areas. That was a tremendous interruption of that, but on the other hand, out of that, I was able to come to Boston, Massachusetts, Harvard Medical School because of this one man mm -hmm. who was very interested in the work that I was doing. So I think I was very lucky overall. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Thompson, uh, like a band says, what a long, strange road it has been. <laughs> but we thank you so much for coming here and sharing your story for the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you, Maureen. Okay. I enjoyed it very much. Thank okay. you.